Um, yeah, so, I guess. So what's really, the topic? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll grab my water. Um, the topic was, well, if you. I don't care. I mean, I, the, you, Marcus found this article that he'd been reading, and uh, he presented it last week. Uh, we discussed it. I think it was Thursday and Friday or something. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. Uh, and there's like a, some interesting ideas in it. And so um, I think it would be just good to go and try to review it again really quickly what it is. Um, and, um, and then we can take it from there. So uh, I'm happy you want to do that, Marcus. You yeah. want me to do that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I can talk about it. All right. So, um, yeah, there's a paper from, it's from late 2017 from Kate Jeffrey's group called like a dual axis rotation rule for something. Updating the end direction cell reference frame during movement in three dimensions. Yeah. I don't see it when he says in research articles, where are you going? The neurobiology and navigation, like another title. So it seems like there's almost like two titles here. Well, I think, uh, so, so I think that this is, um, okay. I, I think there might be multiple papers under that. Well, I thought so too, but then it's this research article, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, it was like it was some special edition of, of journal of physiology that I picked up. Anyway, there you go, October uh, 2017. It was, uh, published. Yeah, so um, this, I, I saw it a while ago, but uh, last week I, I finally like understood the update rules and it, like how to update orientation under their theory, and it's actually really nice. Uh, and it and it it poses head direction cells uh, differently than than we've often talked about them. Um, so head direction cells. I mean, as the animal, if the animal's on a like on a flat surface, on on like if they're if they're basically if they're coplanar with gravity or coplanar with like um, perpendicular to gravity, uh, head direction cells of course behave in like this way we understand where. A given move into movement, a given rotation to the right causes the bump of activity to move around the a ring with some like fixed amount of that movement. Uh, so the ring is perhaps metaphorical. It's not. It's, uh, it's not just sure. a set of neurons. Yeah. Set of neurons activated in the sample. Yeah, yeah. And then you can, if you as the analyzer, can take those neurons and sort them visually like this, yeah. so that it's as if a bump of activity is moving around them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and. So one way um, that this could handle 3D, uh, the, one way this could handle um, animals, for example, walking up hills, walking over hills, around hills, uh, or you could also just even talk about flying animals going in any, um, or, or, or any robotic system that's going uh, in any 3D orientation. But one way that that could all work would be just a simple projection down uh, Jeff drew this last week. I'll just use that picture. Uh, where one way it could work is like if the animal's facing like to the side. What, well, what head direction do cells do is they just like project it down to the to the to like the earth plane uh, and represent that angle. Uh, they and as the animal rotates around here, this rotates around here. Um, but one complication with that is that. Once, once the animal is not coplanar with Earth, I'll call it the Earth to the azimuthal plane, uh, then these updates are no longer linear, where depending on uh, what way the animal is facing on this inclined plane, uh, the, the projected direction um, is go how much it updates with a given rotation varies. Like it, uh, it'll be much larger up here, it'll be much smaller here. Uh, and so that those update rules become complicated. Uh, so this this paper proposed uh, a different way that head direction cells could behave in 3D, uh, and it has data to support it. Support it. Uh, and Marcus, can I? Can, yeah. I think you said it clearer last week. But another way of saying what you just said, but I think it might be a little clearer, yeah. is to say that we we one way we thought about doing 3D orientation. You have a bunch of 1D orientation modules that are different projections of 3D orientation space, just like we can imagine, like you did in the paper with Merkel. And so that's one way of doing it. And this paper proposes a very, very different way of doing it. Uh, and that is 
that is the different way of doing it. And you said this last time is that you just have 2D orientation cells, but there's another thing called a reference vector, which in this case of the rat would be gravity. So if you know the orientation of gravity to your body and you know your 2D orientation, that is sufficient to know your 3D orientation. That's how you originally expressed yeah, it. Yeah, I was about to bring that up. Okay, so I think we're talking about all the projections and stuff, it's yeah. a little bit complicated. No, no, it was clear to me. Oh, okay, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I thought that was more confusing to me. So, yeah. all right, fine, sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, the, um, all you need to know is the angle. If you know, once you know the angle, you can compute it. So that's another. I guess gravity could also work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. That's, so, that thing is, that angle has to be coming yeah. from someplace. Yeah, yeah. So, the, um, in this, so in this projection version, yeah, rotating to the right will not cause a linear change to the head direction cells, uh, except in the special case where you're, where you're on the, the plane of, or where you're, where you're coplanar with the azimuthal plane. Uh, then what they propose is, and it's going to involve bringing in this notion of a reference vector or a gravity vector or something, uh, something like that. Um, but what they propose is, no matter um, what plane you're on right now relative to the azimuthal plane, um, if no matter how you're standing on a hill, if you're, no matter how the rat is, uh, wherever it is, as it rotates on its current plane. Uh, the head direction cells will update linearly. Uh, and the way they make this work is, um, is the rat or you are always aware of some reference vector. Uh, uh, and, and a plausible one in many cases is gravity. Okay, because, you know, just, so, like, just back up a second. Yeah. Wouldn't it, what would happen in the case of that, uh, the, Head direction orientation circle was it uh, was aligned with the reference vector. I mean, yeah. it, uh, you say it would update linear still. Yeah, like if like if you're climbing up, wow, if it's driving, you run straight up the face. Yeah, you're straight up the side. Like if if the rat is like climbing up the face yeah. and rotating around like this, yeah. uh, it'll always still be totally linear. Yeah, uh, the, the yes, it'll still be linear. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. So it's literally representing your orientation on that plane that you're on. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that, that's yeah. what it's always represented. Yes. 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 So, so these head direction cells have two update rules. Um, one is the one we're familiar with. Rotating clockwise causes it to rotate clockwise by a linear amount. You do it 90 degrees, it rotates 90 degrees. Um, the second update rule, though, to make it where this all works, uh, because that that only rule... takes care of one dimension. It doesn't care of like it, it takes care of this thing, but you could also rotate this way. Yeah. And gravity wouldn't. Yeah. Really in that case. Yeah, and if you any if you only had that update rule, um, then you can get all these contradictions where different paths. If they're if you're walking around a hill or on top of a globe, like if you if you go down here and then up, versus if you just go up. Um, you're going to get these contradictions where different paths to the top of this globe um, will cause a different head direction cells to be active for a given angle. So we want path, we want path integration to work yeah. with orientation. And so that anyway, anytime I come back to the same point of the globe, the same position, I need to have the same orientation and that wouldn't occur. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Uh, so the second update rule here is, um, so, so yes, as you just said, uh, all we've talked about so far is rotations on this plane. Um, the other set of possible um, changes in orientation is to rotate this plane uh, in various directions. And um, the update rule is, okay, as this plane, the plane that the rat is on, rotates relative to the gravity vector, the reference vector, um, if it rotates into the vector, like if it rotates toward it, the head direction cells don't update. Uh, that has no effect on the head direction cells. So if the rat walks like up here and then like, one way to put it is if the if the the direction I'm facing 
if uh, if the plane only moves like this and like this in the direction I'm facing, then it doesn't update. Any other any other change, it would. This this uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so is it, yeah, similarly, if the rat walks, if it climbs up the wall, climbs up on top, head direction cells just stay constant. Huh. If this plane rotates around, uh, if it rotates about the gravity vector, then the head direction cells rotate by the same amount. Uh, they rotate linearly as this plane rotates about the gravity vector. Uh, oh, so, about the gravity vector. Mm -hmm. so, so if the rat, uh, like, sidles around this corner, yeah. uh, that's a 90 degree rotation that causes the head direction cells to rotate by 90 degrees. Technically, I think maybe that would be counterclockwise, but it, it would rotate by 90 degrees. Uh, and this two, like, these two just very simple update rules of just update the head direction cells linearly uh, with both rotations on the plane and rotations of the plane about the gravity axis. Um, give you this path integration property with orientation where uh, where any path to any point on this cube or any point on this sphere. Okay. Uh, something I don't know yet is how up, the upside down is handled. I don't I don't have that intuition yet. I don't know how well it handles uh, the rat turning upside down. That there are some complications there because suddenly the gravity vector is negative. So I, I'm not confident there. Uh, but the rest of this is a, at least walking on the top half of this sphere uh, and the, everything from the bottom it's, of this it's, it's, it's totally not obvious that there's a difference between the top and the bottom. Are you saying there is? I'm there's just saying I'm not confident there. Are they talking about that in the paper? Or yeah, they, they, the they, direction you want to go would be flipped. It should be flipped, ideally. Like so in one like, case, uh, it might be like uh, counterclockwise, the other way, yeah. the same motion should be flipped clockwise. Maybe, something like that. So, like, uh, what do you call that? Northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, the water goes differently. Yeah, that's why I call flush it. What's his name? I forgot the name for that. The whatever effect that causes hurricanes to be rotating the different one. The toilet thing's a myth, though. I know it is, but it is. But it's true with hurricanes. It is a true, it is a true, it is a true rhythm, but the toilet thing's a myth. But the hurricane thing's true. Yeah. Like the forces. Yeah, the hurricane forces. The forces that changes. The toilet flush monitors, whatever with the water comes out. <laughs> there are people on Twitch right now just screaming, like, <laughs> it's the something effect. Uh, yeah, uh, anyway. Uh, um, so, but yeah, I mean, I could just say, like, the confusion about the upside down is, like, is um, imagine walking to, okay, the rat it tilts into, the rat walks this way, keeps walking straight. Walks this way, keeps walking straight. Head direction cells don't update because it's tilting into the gravity axis. Yeah. Uh, it, it walks around to the bottom, keeps walking straight. That would suggest that that that, um, that these are the two head direction north directions. Um, so I could make a case that okay, on the bottom, this one should be active when you're pointing this way. Or I could say that. You're like, talking about the problem at the bottom half, the top half. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or uh, you could make the case that okay, if the rat is right here and it's walk, it's strafing to the side, it's, it sidles over the corner, it, uh, it side steps down this way. Um, well, its plane is is still just rotating relative to the gravity vector. So if, if the rat is like walking like I'm like here, then I'm here. And I'm here. If the rat's walk, uh, walking down this direction, it sidles down to the bottom, and now it's facing that way. And now I've just made an argument that the cell should be active when the rat's facing this way on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I can I can make arguments for both directions, and I don't know how to how to rat make sense of all the solution to that. In this? They they in the discussion they said we've left this part out, and they address it shortly. Uh, I need to do some thinking about it on my own before I can. So the, now, in order to represent the, the, the proper orientation in 3D, I can't just rely on one set of grid cells, um, right? Because it doesn't encode that. Um, so uh, I'm assuming, and I don't know if they've addressed this in the paper, um, I'm assuming that if I have a set of grid cells and they anchor independently, uh, multiple sets of grid cell modules, uh, and they anchor independently, then I would have that information. Is that correct? I'm, um, okay. I'm, you made a leap there that I'm, 
you brought up a good sales. If I just so look at this like grid sales line, this guy's a good sales line. So you're saying grid sales, but right now you're talking about the uh, I'm not sorry, I'm orientation sales. Sorry, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, orientation sales. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So just if I hit one module like that, it's yeah. insufficient. And um, so I mean what is the solution to that? Um, is the solution to combine that with with the gravity vector, or is it the solution to have uh, multiple orientation modules that are anchored differently? And it's, would that suffice? They're mostly talking about this and a gravity vector. Would it would it work if I had? I'm not, I don't know yet. I'm just trying to uh, hang on to an idea we had before. It, if I had multiple orientation uh, modules and they anchor it independently, would they sufficiently encode uh, 3D orientation? Well. You see, I'm separating out the update rule, which requires the reference vector, yeah. from the I want to represent this for prediction purposes. You know, I need a cell population to represent my 3D orientation. Uh, and uh, do I do that by combining a single grid orientation module with a reference vector, or do I just take a bunch of uh, orientation modules that are updated using these new rules? Um, so I guess I, I can answer, I can address that question indirectly in a couple ways. Uh, the one, one thing to keep in mind is that the rules that we're talking about for updating these um, requires this ring, this ring of cells to be able to read out the gravity vector. Uh, it, it needs to be able to. To update it, I need to know them. Yeah. Yes, I so, agree. I understand that. But that doesn't tell me how I represent 3D orientation. I can't. I can't. If I obviously, if I know the gravity vector and I know the orientation cells, I, I can, in theory, I have the information I need, right? But when I actually need a, a cellular encoding in mm -hmm. a column, um, uh, how's that being done, right? So. So the 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 initial the logical just first thing to reach for first. Um, First thing that comes to mind, and I have no idea how to draw a sphere on a whiteboard, but um, basically, uh, not, not a 2D ring, because that'd be a torus, but uh, imagine a ring that's like the surface of a, of a sphere, where like there's a cell here, there's a cell here, there's a cell here, etc. cetera. Uh, and this represents like the direction of the, of the gravity vector. Well, what do you mean? How's it a ring? You're just saying I it's, it's, not, it's not a ring. It's it's sort of like a ring, and then like the the activity. Oh, oh you're just talking about the, the gravity vector. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so well, like, we don't know how that's represented yet. Um, but you're saying, I mean, so that's imposing a lot of stuff on the gravity vector, I guess. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. That's like a, in some sense, if if I have that gravity vector, uh and I have that encoding you just talked about there, that is a 3D orientate, or is it, is it a 3D orientation of, of the relative to the gravity vector? Is that what it is? So, I mean, this is like a 2D locate, this is a point on a sphere, so which is 2D. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then this is the third yeah. uh, dimension. You, you could also, I mean, like this is the, this is the 2D version, or, or you could do like a latitude and a longitude, yeah. essentially. Uh, that those are those are a little weird though, like because it's like it's like a ring and a half, uh, a latitude and a longitude. Um, you, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like a ring and a half, and yeah. I, I don't know about. I don't know. I'm going to think about these. Like, what what are the ways of doing? I mean, sometimes you could argue. Okay, I forget which of the right terms were, but that the, the two D one, the gravity vector is is uh, uh, what well, I don't. I keep I should know this because it's a boring term. Is is it the it's everything except for the uh, uh, the yaw. I think it's like that, right? So it's it's like it's the two of those things, the minus, and then the ring provides the last one. It's the yaw, which is like a butter. It's turning like this. Yeah. Um, then um, so that's one way of looking at. It. But then that begs the question: How the gravity vector is encoded, and how do I take this population? I guess I'm trying to, you know, I want to know is there, where's our population of cells? You know, I didn't let you answer the question. So I should let you finish. Then there's probably a cell that I need to be able to read out, which allows me to make some sort of prediction about my input. And so if I have a ring and I have this 2D record, you know, latitude and longitude, I have enough information. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but keep going. I mean, I said most of it. Like, and then otherwise, like, 
a third option that I don't know if I'm the third option that I'm pondering if it's worth talking about is um, something that comes up in robotics a lot, a way that rep, that um, that 3D orientations get represented in robotics is through quaternions, uh, which are these four dimensional numbers that make everything work really nicely. I'll come back to you if, if that's worth the, our attention right now. Um, it may not be that it may be the case that we don't need to think about those at, other than when we're um, when we're figuring out how these cells all need to be interconnected, but it may not be necessary to talk about those. But anyway, the point is there is another or uh, and I'll just say quater quaternions is another thing. Uh, but I don't know if we'll actually need to talk about that. Uh, so there are a few options. This is what I'm thinking about right now is exactly like if we do implement this as a set of cells, how should they all be connected to each other along with motor commands so that they update appropriately. I mean, even just, but this just begs the question like, okay, where does this latitude and longitude come from? And how is that represent the brain? What neural structures are doing that? Um, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I, I keep wanting to think like, okay, I'm trying to squeeze this into some sort of yeah. structure we know about in the, cort the cortical column. And that may not be right, but I want to try it. Well, and, and so like, you know, okay, could 6A be representing that two day, you know, we, we think of grid cells as a 2D representation and we need to somehow get to 3D. Here's another 2D representation, which if we add orientation, we get to 3D. So maybe I'm thinking, oh, well, is there a set of modules now that represent the, the gravity vector? And, uh, and they, they represent it the same way they sort of, you know, uh, grid cells do or something like that. And, um, and then, you know, then I'm laying on top of this orientation on top of them. I think we talked about maybe last week a little bit like that idea, like, you know, 6A and 6B. I keep liking the idea that 6A and 6B are basically the same structure. And so maybe they're both like grid cell modules that are modular things where you get a unique representation. And, and so maybe the one way to think about it, maybe, the, maybe one, of them is, one of them is like the 2D gravity vector. And the other is the 2E linear vector in grid cells, and then maybe orientation slices through all of them, and the, the ring thing. Because I keep, I, keep, I keep coming back to that idea, which just drives me crazy. They've got this column, and you've got these mini columns that seem to have some sort of like, you know, orientation look to them. Uh, and we don't know why they go through all the columns, uh, all the layers. We don't know why they go through all the layers. So there's some cells in all the layers that look like orientation. Every layer, not all the cells, there's a subset of the cells, but in all the layers. And then we have these two things which look like, you know, like they would be good good places for, you know, like a grid cell module. And maybe the other one is this, you know, uh, for back of a better word, gravity vector module, something like that. You know, I don't know, somehow, because you have to resolve all these things at once. You got to resolve the orientation, you got to resolve the gravity vector, you got to resolve the the good cell modules. So anyway, when I look at this, I go, yeah, you've got enough information here, but where the hell is this guy coming from? <laughs> you know? What does it look like? What are the neurons? I mean, I know that if you're thinking at that level, I mean, you described in this paper, they have sort of a very simplistic neural model that was, you know, sort of, you know, bare bones. Um, so that, that I, I, I'm just asking these questions because I'm trying to fit this into this somehow. So um, I'm not being critical at all. One source of ideas, at least, is going to be um, that our vestibular system is almost is pretty much definitely encoding something like this. Yeah, but we talked we talked about oh, that's true for my head direction, but it's not going to be true for my finger. Um, yeah, but just if we want inspiration for how neurons represent a gravity vector oh, or, or, or a reference vector, yeah, yeah, uh, it seems like a good place. Maybe, to although I, you know, one could perhaps, although we talked about this too last week, that. We have multiple ways of doing these things, and we have multiple ways of updating grid cells. Some are, you know, it could, it could be motor, but it could be, we also know it's by sensors, also by sensor flow. Optic flow does these things. So I was, I was thinking this weekend, not very much, so don't think about it. But I was thinking, like, okay, I don't, ex you know, I can accept in the entorhinal cortex or the uh, hippocampal complex that, yeah, I might be using focus, I might be using vestibular, I might be using, I may even have a true gravity thing, because a lot of animals have. You know, magnetic particles in the brain to detect these things. Um, but when it comes to the cortex, that's generally not going to work at all. Uh, I have to, I have to, to use the same mechanism, not just for my fingers moving around an object, which are all different positions, all and not involving the vestibular system. But I also have to work. We have the same mechanism. We're going to work for conceptual objects, words, and you know, high-level thoughts. And, 
So there's got to be more of a pure neural mechanism for doing this. And um, then I was thinking like, well, did, you know, like we mentioned last week, do I, do I establish a, a, a vector, a preferred vector for this cup? Because, you know, I made my pick the long dimension, you know. Um, and so is that something we do for objects we hold in our hands? We just sort of use some sort of sensory input to decide what the preferred vector is, um, you know? I don't know. I don't want to stop anymore. You know, I, that, I mean, that was. I mean, I have, I have kind of a similar feeling in this. Case. I don't. I don't. I found it very difficult to believe it would be hard coded, gravity encoded thing everywhere in the neocortex. Not in the neocortex. And yeah. it would have to be some. Well, what you want to do is, as you make motions, you want to be able to predict the sensory input you're going to feel. That's yeah. the underlying um, thing. And you know. You, take whatever sources of input and you have a generic system that learns transformations and learns how to take proprioceptive input and whatever input it's getting and, and make predictions. And if you get the, give it the right input, like gravity and so on, it will learn this particular mechanism. If you give it some other system, the other set of the system of information, it would learn to use that to do the transformation. At the end of it, you want a generic system that can learn transformations. Yeah. Um, and this is an example of a simple transformation. There may be much more complex transformations you need to do for doing mathematics and equations. And so Maybe not. I don't know. I, it's yeah. not clear to me yet. Um, you know, uh, it's not clear to me that we could. I mean, my first assumption is there's going to be the same transformation everywhere. I mean, I don't know. That's what I would go for. Um, you know, I just want to throw out another thing, which I would. I mean, why would gravity be important in manipulating equations? It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. So what do you mean? John, it's so important. just one thing here, gravity yeah. is a is a stand and we're yes, the more yes. general term is a reference vector. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so, so my point, my point. And, and but that reference vector could be computed from sensory cues. No, no, I think it has to be. It has to be. That's what I'm saying. Some no, no, that's what I'm saying. Or, I think we're on the same thing. I'm saying that uh, gravity could work in the hippocampal complex because you know that makes sense for that. And the vestibular system can totally play into it. As you move your head, your vestibular system changes, but not when I move my fingers. And you could say, well, that I have proprioceptive, maybe that saves the soul room. But the, ideally, you would use a pure sensory input. So my, my point was not that I think it may be a mistake to look for this particular circuit in the neocortical column. It may be better to think about what a generic transformation circuit could be that could learn this, but could also learn other stuff. Well, I, well, of course. I mean, I, but isn't that what we're doing in general relating to the hippocampal complex with the neocortex, right? We're, we're not assuming it's identical. Um, but Marcus's point, I mean, you might get some inspiration by looking at the vestibular system. It has to kind of maybe in a simple case reduce to this, but it would, might be able to do a lot more than that. Oh, maybe. Oh, I see the point. You know, one thing I want to point out, I've, I've mentioned this many times in the past, and I, you know, we think about the input to the like, cortical column coming into layer four, right? This is your input, and 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 then we have this other one that it's, and so then there's this. Then the, here's to say 6B and 6A and there's 5 here. And we know that this, there's this other input that comes in right around the border between 5 and 6. And um, it seems to be everywhere. And, uh, and so in the past, you might remember, I was, I was trying to think of what, why would you have this? What purpose of it? And, I, and I, I, I speculated once before that this might be establishing orientation. I talked about that. It might be establishing orientation uh, as I could, I needed to know my orientation, but that was, I couldn't ever make any sense of it. It was, it was an intuitive idea, like, oh, I have a sensory input, but I need to know my orientation. And that, that, that I always talked about maybe like the, there was bigger cues. I said, this might have a broader, um, a broader receptive field so that you, you're looking at a larger area and they'll help you define your orientation. That was a very poorly defined idea, but if I, if a more specific version of that would be saying, oh no, it's not really orientation, you might be just assigning your reference vector. Um, which is not the same as orientation, but it's this key. I, again, what would be the thing I would need to establish a reference vector for a coffee cup? Uh, would, if I were to do it by pure sensory cues, I, I can imagine it would be sort of its, its general, um, um, you know, its, its aspect ratio, or something like that, right? Marcus, you think it's something? I was distracted. Sorry, oh. cube. Sorry about that. Okay, because you had to look on your face like you were thinking something good. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, um, 
So anyway, I just I'm throwing this out again because again I'm I'm going to stick try and fit this world into this world. I'm thinking like, well, if I can't rely, I can't rely on vestibular, and I can't. I mean, um, yeah, vestibular, and I don't have gravity. What about, uh, if it's going to be sensory? Something sensory um, that. Uh, and if, and I don't think it's going to be this input because this is the thing I'm trying to predict. So there'd be another place I'd have to have sensory input that could, in some sense, establish uh, perhaps um, the, the reference vector. Um, so anyway, that's just uh, just throw that out there. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that input is. <laughs> so um, and this, you know, maybe this is. I had this intuition that this would be orientation. But maybe that was it was slightly unrefined. Maybe it's this reference vector again, very highly speculative. Um, but something to think about. I mean, it makes sense in the sense of um, of since we know like down here, receptive fields are much longer. Yes. And like like a like a six A uh, those cells as, as like as a. Um, as an oriented edge gets longer and longer, the 6A cells respond um, more and more. Uh, so it, I don't, they respond more and more. I remember them just having a wider area of response. Uh, uh, they, they do respond more and more. Ah, or, or uh, the early papers didn't say that. Maybe it's more reformed. The early ones just said, hey, you know, they, they define the, 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 the length of the line, if you will, mm -hmm. by which you have a certain level of response. And I thought it was just, it continued longer on these guys. You're saying it actually, Gets bigger as you go out. Well, okay. That would be very well, interesting. It, uh, the average, uh, the, 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 um, the ambiguity here is they're averaging over a lot of cells. Uh, it may be that, uh, but, but it's certainly the case that, like, um, that um, this, if, the, if a 6A cell receptive field is, is this long area. And it's responding to that that particular um, that particular orientation here. It's yeah. horizontal. Like this will cause the cell to respond, and then its response gets more and more um, um, real, at least reliable as this gets longer. Oh, I, I, I don't and, remember that. I kind of remember. Yeah, this. I, I could point to the paper. I, I remember that. Um, but so I mean, so it's the, really small. It's not going to be good. Yeah. I was I was I was going back to the very early papers, which goes back a long time, where. Uh, maybe I, I need to be some Mamata where I, I, mean, I kind of remember it was more like, you know, it's almost, it almost like it was tapering off and they put some cutoff point here. Mm -hmm. and beyond that, it, it didn't make a difference. But you're saying actually for some point it got bigger. Yeah. That would be really that interesting. Was, that, that's, that's exactly what you'd want for something like this, right? Right. And well, I mean, the same that, property is true in the layer four, too. It's just that the distances are smaller. Well, the distances are small. I'm not sure if that same property goes in layer four. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Smaller. That is, it's just definitely smaller. Um, so th that resonated a little bit just because like, you could imagine uh, reference vectors being calculated from something larger. Uh, from Yeah, the, that's what the, you do. That's right. Vector. You want, yeah, I'm trying to determine the orientation of this little line here, but my reference vector is going to be this guy. And so my reference vector is going to stay the same even if I rotate my head this way, right? I'm not sure how that all works out because. It's just weird. I mean, if I'm actually rotating my 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 eye, you know, on my head here, this these wood cells are active, and these longer cells would be changing. So, I'm not sure. It's, it's very confusing. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that you know, V1 can only do it up to a certain extent, and V2 can do it to a large extent. I don't know. You know, and it's possible that this is shared. Uh, you know, that has to be shared. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it, I mean, every column could be calculated on its own, um, or maybe not. Maybe, you know, there's also the fact that uh, the layer five has those long range, uh, there's, there's long range connections in layer five. And uh, remember, there's two sets of long range connections, layer three and layer five. And uh, maybe one way to think about those long range connections in layer five is voting on reference vectors, something like that. I mean, to me, this is, a, I, I thought this is a great, because when Marcus presented this, I said, oh, it's real high over it. I've just been stuck on this idea that we're going to represent 3D orientation with a bunch of orientation modules. And that there will all be a projection on the 3D orientation space. Orientation space. Uh, and this suggests otherwise. The other thing that came up last week, which I want to mention so you can think about it through time, is 
we still have the issue of representing 3D linear space, grid cell module space. And again, the assumption was, okay, we're going to need multiple grid cell modules, as in uh, Marcus says in work of the paper. Um, and I was pointing to modules last week, that that's not what it looks like in the brand. I, we don't see any place where we would see all these different modules within a column. Um, and at best, I can look at this is my, this is my recreation of the tank drawing, uh, the tank paper where in about a size of a cortical column, he was showing in the course his entomonic cortex and ice or rat or whatever, but just take that for that. Is imagine this was in a grid cell module. In about a size of a cortical column, you had one set of, you had one basically grid cell module that was divided into multiple bumps, but it was one grid cell module. And, uh, and it's not like, where would I have multiple grid cell modules in a single cortical column? And so, um, the question then becomes is like, well, maybe there isn't one. I mean, you know, is, is the same sort of check that's being done here, where you have this reference vector, could something, could I add a reference vector to this would make this work? I haven't even thought about that yet. I just like, that's another. So going out from the one extreme, we have multiple grid cell modules um, that are different intersections of the different projections of the 3D space. We have multiple orientation modules that are different projections of this orientation space. So now we have like, oh no, we don't need multiple orientation modules. We need an orientation module and a reference vector. And maybe the same thing can happen here. We can have a grid cell module and a equivalent reference vector somehow that get me 3D. That's a very, very high level concept. I have no idea how that would work. <laughs> but I'm just saying we don't see multiple uh, of these guys. Do you have any intuition, Marcus, with that's even like when I, when I say those words, do you go like, oh, that's stupid or that could work or? Um, well, just that like it's something I said before is that orientation is a little bit different from um, location. I uh, that's that's close like, that's, yeah, like Z, the Z goes out, Z axis goes yeah, out forever. It's a close space. Whereas, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, uh, and I guess the other thing that comes to mind, something you kind of pointed out, but uh, that, uh, yeah, so. The current state of this of um, all these cells is essentially a, a point on a rhombus. Like uh, the the manifold of the cell activity here is like this moving around a rhombus and and like yeah. wrapping around. Um, however, as you pointed out, that there's also this like um, this notion of like a mist yeah. field. Yeah. Uh, like sometimes uh, sometimes one of these will be loud. Uh, uh, Higher firing rate, and this will. This was, one will be right right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so that can be thought of as like suddenly this manifold of activity is becoming three D. Well, you have a you have a coding of this, which allows you. Yeah, and really that can that can that's not necessarily just three D because I mean enough variation is like that can the manifold of activity could like go in some in these other strange directions through allowing these to be at different magnitudes. So th there's some flexibility there, but I don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't know how to give it like this path integration property. Like, how do you how do you take these missed bumps and these varying rates and uh, and code something? In hey, you know, let me ask you this: What if, what if this reference vector was like the key thing in all of this? Um, what if? Excuse me if I already said this. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, but what if you know? Again, going back to the mini columns. All right. Is it possible that the mini columns are encoding reference vectors um, and that that's the thing that's passing through everything here and then so in that in that regard you might just to grin and say this is orientation and this is grid cell um, and then you have this what, does that make sense at all that like like what would I expect to see here it, it, we know these we know these many divisions. Um, and so what would happen if um, uh, it's hard to even translate. Like, uh, could they? What, what would be the property I expect to see from a reference vector? Um, you know, it, it, I, what I'm thinking. I'm asking myself the you question. Change the speed at which you move. I, I'm asking the question. If I just showed you a picture and there was, or, or just some line, some or, you know, some uh, gradient, right? Uh, well, it might just look like it's just the orientation. 
But if I actually showed you a real picture of something, or like a real object you're looking at, and that object is changing in different directions, would these cells behave differently? Uh, would they, would they, you know, would I expect, given this model of the reference vector, I have, I have to think about this because I have no idea. You know, would, well, we know they do respond differently when you show an entire object in context. But with the way we've always talked about it now, we talk about it that they respond differently in the sense that they, they activate a subset, right? We've always said, oh, all the mini cells and mini column of fire, and now we're representing a subset of them. Now, that's how we've talked about it. Um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests it's more complicated than that, too. Um, so um, I wonder if actually there's even more going on here than we knew. And that, that it's more like what you just said, maybe these things are really be changing in other ways too, that we, 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 didn't, we didn't understand. And uh, because, you know, even, even in, the, in our model where we say, yes, there's a subset and this cell now is going to fire at some, some specific location on the object or some specific location in a video or something like that. Um, they're not reliable in that regard. They seem to be, they're still, it's still a little weird and wonky. It's sort of like that. Yeah, we see the evidence of that. That's, we see a lot of that. I remember seeing other points I'm saying, hmm, that doesn't quite right either. Like, it doesn't always seem to do it at the same point in time. I don't know why. Um, I'm just wondering what, and then this is, this appears to be just a, a one dimensional encoding. Then you need a two dimensional encoding for the reference vector. Um, There's only a few ingredients here, and they're going to be mapping onto this <laughs> somehow. Anyway, there's another. I just want to throw that as another possibility that perhaps um, the reference vector is the key thing for resolving the grid cell location and the key thing for resolving the orientation cell. Um, you know, this idea here that maybe what if I was in, if I had a, a, a grid cell map, it's also wrapping around. Um, the, the sphere. Right? Um, it's almost exactly the same way. Um, and so my grid cells would look like, like they're always correct in some plane, but as the plane moves around, the way the, the plane rotates, um, then they, you know, so, it, so I, I it, it, they would somehow map differently, you know, just the same way like the, the orientation cell. I see the point of it being an open space versus a closed space, but I don't know. Um, Is there, anything, is there anything about this new way of thinking about this, Marcus? If, um, uh, if I if I had multiple if I had multiple rings like this, I had one vector, but I had multiple grid cell uh, orientation cell modules, um, and uh, each orientation cell. What we wanted to do is each orientation cell module to, to do uh, path integration means when I'm in the same spot on the same orientation, I'm going to have the same cell, right? Yes. So if I if I had a bunch of these and they were um, and they were anchored differently, so they all had that same behavior, but they're anchored differently. Then uh, so there let's say there were n modules and each one had uh, you know uh, n positions, then um, uh, then I would have uh, uh, n to the m um, possible unique orientations, right? So that that I'm just saying, could could I have a representation? Can I still have a representation of orientation that's unique to the object? Yes, it'll be unique to the object. Uh, it won't be unique to the location on the object. Yes. Okay. That's that's okay uh, at the moment, maybe. Um, um, it won't be unique to the location of the object. I sort of get that. Why did you say that so rapidly? What was your conclusion for that? Uh, why do you say well, that? Just the, well, just that movement, non-rotational movement, isn't going to update these. Uh, oh, yeah. Interesting. 
unless every orientation module had this. No, not take that back. <laughs> yeah, so you're saying uh, non rotational movement, meaning like if I'm moving up this way, none of them will change. Is that what you're saying? Uh, <laughs> okay, you know, honestly, what you said was correct. That wasn't what I was saying. No. I just meant regular movement. Like, if, if, if you walk around a room, these aren't changing. But you're also right that as you walk, um, as you walk toward the whatever, toward the gravity yeah. vector, it also won't change. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, you're I'll, going back to the old simpler idea. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. My orientation room is not be specific yet. Uh, um, but, uh, but it would be specific to the room with the object. Right. And then this is a different situation. Sure. As I'm, as I'm, I wouldn't know where I am on that object because, uh, because uh, as I do this, none of them are changing. Right. Well, actually, well, the, anywhere you walk on this, they're all updating coherently. Uh, and if you walk around. Yeah, but, but they wouldn't even be changing if I did that. Right. Sure. right? If, I was, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm just doing this, if this is the reference vector, and I'm just doing this, um, then, um, then none of these modules would be changing. Isn't that what you said? Like if I, as I rotate up towards the pole here, the, then none of them are updating. Correct. That's weird because then. With the gravity. Oh, well, well, then I haven't taken into account the gravity. Thing. So yes. So, um, I, right, where I was going with this, I, I just, 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 again, this is very super, super, super speculative. Uh, just, just I want to just practice the words. You could have, you can have a, um, you have a reference vector, okay, that's going to be stable for the object. It's going to be essentially anchored to the object. Then you're going to have orientation modules, um, which could be, uh, would you be unique to the object? But not unique to location uh, in multiple ways. Then you could have uh, you could have grid cell or, or location modules. Let's just call it location modules. Grid cell location modules. Um, I'm wondering. Uh, if I just if I took tanks idea here, um, then I wouldn't even have unique locations on the object. I, I I could in theory have the same encoding. I would have the same encoding at different places. This 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 wouldn't be unique. This is just one module, and it's it doesn't it's not unique. So it would it wouldn't be uh, it's it's not unique uh, to object, and it's not even. Really unique to location. Yeah. To location on the object, it's it's for most cases it would be sufficient, but not for all. Um, then we have these we have these three things, and the question is: that, Are these three things together sufficient to do everything we need? Like for example, I have some location, but it's not unique to the object. But I do on my orientation, which is unique to the object. So to combine those two, it's going to be unique to the object. Um, and uh, this is not unique to location. This is not technically unique to location, but it would be more unique than this. But maybe together, the chances of you know messing up would be uh, uh, maybe together would be sufficient. Um, so not everything has to. Not all these representations have to be unique to the object and unique to location. It's the combination that's important. Um, this one here is not unique to anything, right? The reference vector. It's just a, it's, it's anchored to the object, but it wouldn't be unique to the object or unique to location. So it's, it's, um, it's just anchored. You know, so I'm thinking like, oh, what if I had multiple orientation modules and I got multiple grid cell modules? And I have ref I got reference vectors slicing down through them somehow. <laughs> um, and the intersection, these the intersection where I have to I have to resolve this, the same thing has to be resolved in here and here using the same reference vector. Um, 
is is going to guarantee that these guys are in cahoots and everybody's represent everything I need to represent is being represented. Um, something along those lines. And they could be taking advantage of this kind of trick. Uh, uh, you know, again, imagining imagining somehow perhaps these are like mini comps coming down through here, and that that you've got this you've got this. Uh, whether it's the grid cell module orientation modules, maybe they're just the same like this. And then you're slicing that down really them, bad when I have my mic mini -coms on. that are saying, okay, this, this guy and this guy are the ones we want to care about right now. That's a, you know, that's my unique coded. That's say, okay, I don't know my location no, specifically, but now I do because it's this unique pattern that I'm encoding here, which is the intersection of orientation and this, all these things have to combine together to be the same thing, something like that. I think the ultimate solution is going to look something like this. It's some sort of flavor. Of yeah, my mic, my mic is way better. All right, I'm the, I should just set up for a while here. So, we talk, you have anything you want to talk about add or questions or observations? No, I, mean, I, I, I feel like we should be looking for a system that can learn these things rather than a hard coded system. That's my bias. Uh, did we say anything one way or the other about that here? No, no just, I, I think just, it's just, I'm just, just trying to add another don't, don't, yeah, okay, don't forget uh, that. Don't saying. forget that. And the, you know, the network of pyramidal cells can learn a lot of different methods. A lot of these transformations can be learned by pyramidal cells or dead hmm. So I think to the extent that you can think of this as a function with input that gives a certain output, and given the same input, you always yeah. get the same output, you can. One of the one, one of the things that I've been pushing back on, um, uh, and not completely, but just somewhat, and I, Mark again talked about this, is the idea. Of, well, can, you know, one way that parameter cells can do these things is they can recognize one pattern on one part of the dendrite, another pattern on another part of the dendrite, or maybe they, you're getting two sets of inputs converging, and you want to, you know, you want to do this sort of and, um, convergence on a dendritic branch, and I just don't like that. Uh, I think it's less. Uh, so the to say that parameter cells can do these calculations, sometimes we wonder what the solutions require that kind of specificity on the dendrites, and that doesn't seem right to me. Um, it could be, but well, that's where the learning comes in because, like our sequence memory, the, the patterns learned on the dendrites are very specific. Yeah, but, 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 but my point is, yeah, I know, I know, but uh, all I'm pointing out is if I look at the dendritic cell and I have the dendritic branch here, we on the sequence memory. There's a, there's a population of cells, and we just we're just yes. forming synapses. Yeah. But there is we don't require oh there's two populations of cells, and I need to do the coincidence between those. It's it's like you know like this could be uh, What's the variable A and variable B. The, in, in the sequence memory, there's just one set of things. Yeah. It doesn't matter how I sub sample it, it's going to work. Yeah. But if I'm trying to, for example, have a, a neuron a dendrite that says okay, I'm going to respond when variable A is it. Two and variable B is at six, um, and, and these are two separate cell populations in different different places, and I have to make sure I equally sample this and this. It's the fact that I have to equally sample both of them. That is where I get nervous. I don't like that. Uh, I'm just pointing out that that's that's one tool that Marcus has used in the past, which is okay, but I don't like it. Um, yeah, that's what I've used to. The okay. Yeah. So to me, when when we can say parental cells can do these things. That gets a little bit. You talk about learning rules. This gets me nervous because I don't. I don't. I'm not comfortable that it's doable. Yeah. In, in the past, often when I have used this trick, I've said that I've justified it, saying that this could be genetically determined connections. Yeah. Like, I, like there are often in our circuits, there are portions of the circuit that could be genetically determined, and other parts that yeah. could be learned. And I usually try to put these tricks on genetically determined. Yeah, yeah. But, but you don't have to because I've shown you can learn these things too. Uh, and you can learn them reliably. You just need a you need to sample a slightly larger number. But how do you guarantee that you're going to get this equally? You know, this it just equally. comes out of the statistics because they're you're only going to learn if the two of them together can make the prediction. If only uh, one of them okay, can so, make a prediction, sure. they won't learn it. All right. Uh, I still think there's sometimes it's a little tricky. It's a little tricky, it it's a little tricky and sometimes that's a problem. Yeah. So I just want to point out that. I, I keep coming back to there, there, there appears that with these mini columns, there appears to be a structural computational element going on. It just it's the only way I can describe why I can think of why they would all have these why you have these orientation columns, these mini columns going through all the layers. It's, 
it's like there's some I'm distributing this this is another bus that's intersecting these guys and it somehow seems to be doing computational parsing or something uh, it just looks like it um, it's hard to explain why you do it otherwise I mean if all I need to do is sample a set of cells I can just have a set of cells appear and form connections so this is no this is like forcing a yeah, some sort of computational structure on the thing. That's why I keep coming back to it. Uh, it might be wrong, but I keep thinking that that's a, probably a, a good way to think about it. So I think, yeah, we can learn it, but I also think there's a, there's a structural component. Maybe some of it's genetic. So maybe the, obviously we have to learn it. It's going to be something genetic. Yeah, and it's just a question of what fraction. Yeah, is yeah. And, but, but I think if I, I'm keeping thinking that the answer is going to, the right answer is going to come out of it, somehow understanding why we have these mini comps going through all these things. So I've always been looking for what were the mini comps we representing that I could, everyone could use. And this is the big question. Orientation. Okay, that makes sense because they look like in vision, at least they look like orientation columns, you know. And, um, but maybe it, there's a, a new idea today or this last week is that perhaps uh, it kind of looks like orientation, but really maybe it's something different like the, like the reference vector, which kind of reference vector might look like orientation under many situations. Um, uh, and then I'm thinking like, what would they then, what would my cell response properties be up here? If I, if I say, oh no, it's not orientation, it's, it's reference vector, what would be the distinguishing thing here? And then maybe if we think about that more, I can come up with some really, because then we could go back in the literature and say, oh, maybe it, it looks like under the default case of this, you know, this anesthetized animal, whatever that will look like orientation, but in reality, under these situations, it would be something different. Um, um, yeah. Right, um, and then of course I'm jumping to the conclusion that maybe the same thing that's going on with orientation, being thinking about one orientation module moving around the sphere with a reference vector, maybe that's the same thing. Yeah, with I like the way it thinks about reference vectors. I think that's a good. And then maybe the grids. We only need one grid cell vector. A grid cell module is doing the same thing. It's instead of you know moving around like this and combined with the reference vector, it tells me you know and the, and this I combine all three. This is a unique object. This may be, yeah, I don't know, but somehow the, all of them together is going to provide you what you need to know. So, I don't know, this is interesting. So we've had a whole new thing, idea, that reference vector is another thing that has to be represented in the system. Marcus, anything else? No, this is very much on my mind, how to make this all so, work. Okay, so, so you, what's the next step? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't talk to you about, Marcus and I were talking about some of the things you uh, you had asked us to think about. Um, we don't need to do that right today, but we were walking through some of the, some of the just structural requirements that the system has to solve. I don't want to do that right now, but we could do it another time. That's in the, do it on Wednesday or something. Yeah, we could do it on Wednesday. Maybe I'll have a chance to think about it. I didn't get a chance for this. Um, yeah, I mean, my my next step is quite easy to just draw as like, okay, orientation, you have like motor going in, uh, you have a ring, we know that, uh, plus question mark, and then some kind of recurrent connection. Uh, what the question mark being what? Uh, uh, so how do you represent the reference, the reference vector? vector yeah. and, and how does everything interconnect in a way along with motor commands so that all this can update in, in a... And so this is, would be a location vector. The output of this would be orientation, would be, a, a, a 3D orientation. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's you, but yeah. the output of the entire thing. Oh, uh, yeah. The, so, so I mean, the, 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 this. I'll, I'll just label this as a 3D orientation. Good call. That I wasn't clear about that. Uh, so, I mean, this this cell population represents a 3D orientation, and it is, it has. A set of update rules as it receives motor commands and it updates itself, and just what's the what is the logical way to break that into that cell population? Are you going to assume there's some reference vector coming in as well of some sort, say gravity or whatever? Well, suppose suppose um, this question mark represents a, a reference vector. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, <laughs> okay. Right. So this is going to update the reference vector as well. Oh, okay. Uh, and so and then and then of... and there's like yes, maybe an optional so it's an uh, vestibular reference vector. This well. It's an inferred reference vector of some sort. Um, yeah, so, uh, yes. Okay. Suppose I give this its initial activity for free. I'm like, I'm going to tell you what this is. I'm going to tell you what the reference vector is. Oh, OK. 
now now update it correctly. Okay. Um, and yes, of course, like I could put a dotted line here of like vestibular or, or this question. Yeah, that was my question. Uh, like they can the, like sometimes the system will have something that tells it its reference vector or it gives it hints about its reference vector. But I'm focused on the, the what we, for lack of a better word, the path integration of it, the updating of it. Yeah, there's a, I wonder. It, I, I have a flavor on this, which is so that would be a good outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of my thoughts, which we talk about the thoughts around the head. Another interesting idea um, is, uh, you know, I think, okay, the reference vector is anchored to the object, right? Um, and then I was going back to thinking like this input here into layer five, which is a sensory thing. Well, Maybe, maybe that's not what we really need. Maybe I don't. Maybe the reference vector doesn't need to be anchored to the object. You know, I'm a column and I'm looking at some subset of something. Um, maybe the reference vector is. It can be. Um, I always want it to be the same reference vector and one on like the same location on the object. But it doesn't have to be the same reference vector at different locations. So. So my point is that I'm a column, I can only see a certain part of the world. And so I have this, this larger perimeter and I have a smaller perimeter. The larger perimeter is this input, the smaller perimeter is this input. And so, um, so I, I can't see everything. I can't know what the true extent of the object is. And, you know, and maybe I can, maybe I'm sharing, I don't know. But the question, what would happen is, only I, I, if this was a somewhat local computation, that's my reference vector could be a local computation, local in terms of some broader area in which I'm touching or something, uh, uh, but may not be global to the object. Um, would, that, would that be a problem? Um, I know in the antiviral cortex, we think of grid cells as always having the same orientation anywhere in the room. So in that case, maybe the room, entire room has the same thing. Um, but on a, on a finger touching an object, that may not be the case. A finger touching an object, um, uh, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Anyway, it's just another thought. Uh, I, I'm just starting off the top of my head, just thinking about the possibilities. Um, um, yeah, and the other thing is, so I mentioned this, Marcus, last week I had to share with you too. This reminds me very, very much what happened when we did, we started delving into grid cells. It was like, okay, you know, Marcus dug into the living grid cells and came back all the stuff we didn't know. And then uh, I was like, oh, that was really interesting. Oh, they work differently. Ah, you know, all this stuff. And then it took us a while to figure it all out. This feels just the same thing. Like, okay, now we're digging into orientation cells. Marcus going, hey, I found these papers. <laughs> and it works differently than we thought it did. Oh, it's really interesting. So I, I'm hopeful that somehow in the same process, it took me, you know, it took us a while, or a month or two, to sort of really get our heads around grid cells. At least it took me that long. Um, that maybe the same thing will happen here with this. Maybe it'll be all come obvious in the next couple of in a month. Weeks coming in and be like, oh, yeah, of course, that's how it works. Um, and then we'll have our answer. You keep typing because I forget I can talk. <laughs> I, I was really excited about this. Okay, so we want to learn it. We got to not rely on vestibular. We got to rely on some sort of sensory input. Uh, we might have voting about it. We might have voting on the, on the vector. Um, that could be what's going on in the layer five voting, which we haven't, um, we haven't really had a need for yet. We haven't really said why we're voting on layer five. Um, that would be another thing that all the column, the local columns, the local columns could vote on the orientation. So that's an interesting idea. Uh, okay, Greg, thank you. Thanks. That was fun. Six. I'm going to roll up here and get a better view of the whiteboard. Oh, could uh, Marcus, would you sure, move the chair? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. There's a couple pictures I didn't get a good view of. I'm going to exit the meeting. Okay.
All right. So you guys got a snapshot of that, hopefully. And that is the end of the research meeting. Thanks for joining. I'm going to go ahead and cut my, uh, cut my stream. And I'll be back at 1 o'clock to talk about responsible AI license. And check out my events calendar on my Twitch stream. It's twitch.tv slash Rhyolite underscore slash events to see exactly what I'm going to be working on the rest of this week. Take care.